Good afternoon. It's 1 o'clock Eastern Time, 12 o'clock Central Time, and it's time to begin the Global Vet Link Veterinary Feed Directive Taking Action Seminar. We're thankful that you're with us today. We have a very good set of speakers for you and do a bio on them, but we want to give you plenty of time to hear what they have to say as well as the chance to ask your own questions. First up today is Richard Sellers. He is the American Feed Industry Association Senior Vice President of Public Policy and Education. He holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Memphis and master's from the University of Arkansas in animal sciences. Sellers' responsibilities include overseeing the legislative and regulatory efforts, interacting with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, state feed control agencies and legislative bodies, and providing comments to those agencies and information about those agencies back to feed industry association members. Next up then is Dr. Christine Hoang, Assistant Director of the Division of Animal and Public Health of the American Veterinary Medical Association. She received both her DVM and MPH through the University of Minnesota's dual degree program and is additionally certified in public health by the National Board of Public Health Examiners. Besides being the resident expert on antimicrobials for the AVMA, she also provides technical and scientific expertise to the Food Safety Advisory Committee, the Council on Public Health and Regulatory Veterinary Medicine, the Steering Committee for FDA Policy on Veterinary Oversight of Antimicrobials, and the newly formed Task Force for Antimicrobial Stewardship and Companion Animal Practice. And then finally today, Kaylin Henry, Product Manager for Global VetLink. So with that, let's get started. We'll transfer now to Richard Sellers at the American Feed Industry Association. Richard, can you hear us? I can. I'm here and ready to go. Please take it away. Pleasure to be here and talk about Veterinary Feed Directive. I've been around regulatory work for some 30 years, and in a uh, period around 1996, we decided we needed to, or 95, we needed to do something because the the Food and Drug Administration was talking about making prescription medicated feeds. So the Veterinary Feed Directive, or VFD, arose in a, a large conversation with a number of organizations, and it was really decided to, to take this approach to keep feeds from becoming prescription medicated feeds because state pharmacy boards told us that uh, RX feeds would have required either a DVM or a registered pharmacist to dispense those from a feed mill, which we found would be extremely disruptive and quite expensive. So VFD was created in the Animal Drug Availability Act in 1996, and, and it says that um, VFD is not a prescription under state or federal law. And, and although you'll hear people talk about it as a script, it's, it's legally not and that's probably an inappropriate term to use. It, it, it legally is a VFD, and it's very different from a prescription. The first drug, tilmycosin, um, which is Pulmatil, an Alanco drug, was approved 70 days later after the, the um, law was signed, which was quite remarkable. The law had enough details in it that it wasn't necessary to do uh, regulations, but the agency published regulations, I think it was in a couple of years, and those regulations stayed pretty constant until they published a series of proposed regulations within the last couple of years. So there are actually um, three compounds with six uses currently that are VFDs for swine, fish, and beef cattle. And it's interesting to note that FDA promised that none of the current drugs would retroactively be made VFD, which is now going to be the case. Um, so last, last June, FDA amended the VFD rule and created a number of changes in it that I'll be discussing, some of which we had requested for some 15 years. So the process is fairly easy. I want to kind of bring everybody up to speed if you're not familiar with VFD. So a veterinarian visits a producer under a veterinarian client-patient relationship, and I'm sure Dr. Wong will talk about that in a moment, uh, or the producer calls the veterinarian. The veterinarian decides under that that relationship that the producer's animals need uh, a drug that's under the control of a veterinary feed directive. In other words, the drug regulation requires that this VFD order be issued by a veterinarian so that the producer can use it. So the VFD is actually a license for the producer to use this product in the manner described by the veterinarian in accordance with the drug regulation. So either the veterinarian or the producer 
gives this VFD to the feed distributor, and that can be a feed mill, it can be a dealer, it can actually be the veterinarian um, uh, if, if the veterinarian has signed a particular thing known as an acknowledgement letter. But the veterinarian retains the original VFD, the producer gets a copy, the feed distributor gets a copy, and the feed distributor has to have notified FDA that they intend to distribute a VFD, and that list is published online. It's thousands of establishments, uh, and in order to receive the drug from the supplier, the feed manufacturer or feed distributor must send an acknowledgement letter to the drug supplier saying two things. One, we will not distribute this VFD feed or a drug containing a VFD feed, uh, a feed containing a VFD drug without um, getting a, v a valid VFD or a similar acknowledgement letter. So there's, there's some discrepancy right now about whether a producer can be a feed distributor. Uh, if they've acknowledged and they can distribute the feed, then they can receive a VFD drug without having a VFD, but they have to be, uh, under the regulations, be a feed distributor. So the veterinarian uh, visits the producer, issues a VFD, and that VFD either goes to the feed distributor from the producer or from the veterinarian, and the feed distributor issues the VFD feed to the producer based on what the VFD says. So how did we get to where we are where the agency is taking the action that they proposed, which is basically removing all the growth promotion, feed efficiency, and milk production claims? For, for a number of years, the agency has, has claimed that uh, there is some antibiotic resistance caused by use of um, production drugs in animal agriculture. I'm not going to argue whether that's bad science, good science. We're, AFI tends to stick with the VFD issue. So FDA lined out in a guidance document known as 209, which we don't talk about a whole lot, a judicious use for medically important drugs. Now, medically important is a euphemism for human important drugs, and we refer to them as dual-use drugs used in both human medicine and in animal medicine, and most of these are antimicrobials. Uh, the agency wanted them to be used for therapeutic purposes only, including prevention. They, they also strongly suggested that they would be required to have a veterinary oversight via the veterinary feed directive. Subsequently, they issued a, uh, a guidance for industry number 213 that laid out what judicious use is and what the expectations for the drug sponsors in the feed industry would be. Uh, this came out in uh, December of 2013, and it said by December of 2016, this coming December, all drug sponsors should agree to take growth promotion feed efficiency claims and, and use only therapeutic claims, including prevention. It would require the authorization of a licensed veterinarian via the veterinary feed directive. And also said that products that are used in water and are currently over the counter would become prescription products and that products used in and on feed over the counter would become VFD. The agency hasn't really put out anything about injectables, oral dosage forms. In our discussions with them, they've said they've not uh, tended to move in that direction at this time to take those into RX from OTC. So the final rule was published in, in June 3rd, and the drugs that are currently listed at this long website at the bottom are those that are listed on the screen, and those are the drug names because there may be one, more than one supplier, and the trade name listing on here would get quite long, so I decided to list that. So you'll get a copy of these. Uh, uh, some of them are not marketed. Uh, Avilomycin is actually a new product coming onto the market. Fluorophenicol has is, is got two uses. Um, it's a Merck product. It's already VFD. And Tilmycosin was the first product, uh, and it's got a couple of uses in swine and, and beef cattle. So what's going to happen? So the guidance documents tell the drug sponsors, as I said, to change from growth promotion, feed efficiency, and claims in milk production to therapeutic and prevention claims by this December. This requires data submission and approval or updates to the claims. Likely, we'll just remove those growth promotion claims and, and change the labels, and those updates uh, and an agreement will probably happen sometime this summer. So there's about 19 chemical entities with an actual 280 plus uses um, which constitute the new animal drug applications or what's referred to um, commonly as the drug, the, animal, the approved animal drug. 
So all of these drugs in, that I listed on a previous screen would come under the control of a veterinarian via um, VFD. This would include many feed drugs except dewormers, carbidox, bambromycins, ionophores, facetracin, and a few non-ionophore coccidiostats. So we, and, and obviously some of the other products such as uh, um, some steroid products. Um, we focused on the VFD process and the administrative changes. One of the things we've noticed and had a lot of complaints about is that for 4-H and F, uh, FFA use animals, VFDs will be required in a veterinarian and a vet client-patient relationship as well. So the practical things. So the veterinarian retains the original and provides the copy to the producer and the feed distributor. You can send the fact, the veterinarian can send a fax to a feed distributor and or producer. Um, electronic VFDs are allowed through Global Vet Link. Um, the previous rule said that uh, originals had to be sent within five days. That's no longer the case. Phone-in VFDs are not allowed because, um, let's say, regulated professionals such as a pharmacist are not taking those orders, so it might be confusing. Females can deliver smaller amounts and list it on the VFD and save the rest for later. So if you get a large order at a feed mill, they may deliver a certain amount noted on the VFD and then move on and hold it uh, for use later. Uh, one of the things that's important is the VFD has an expiration date, and that's not the last date it can be manufactured, but the last date it can be used. So if, if the actual use time on the VFD is shortly after it's manufactured, the manufacturer will likely tell the um, producer that they likely need to get another VFD to continue to use that beyond the expiration date on the VFD. So we're having some discussions with FDA about delivering VFD medicated feeds to the farm before the producer has a VFD form, and that, that appears to be not appropriate right now unless the uh, producer is a feed distributor, which is a little more complicated than I want to go into now. So the current challenge is, is the VFD approvals increase a lot of paperwork um, and a lot of review times for the feed mills, and they will encourage electronic VFDs. I think most of the products that are used now um, go through VFD except for, I think, the fluorophenicols. So we're put at a disadvantage when we can't serve the customer appropriately due to either an incorrect form or not receiving it in, in the appropriate time frame. As I indicated earlier, storing VFDs prior to use and prior to receiving the VFD is a problem for producers and currently isn't allowed unless the producer is a feed distributor. So we're addressing these issues with FDA, of, especially in the areas of aquaculture where there may not be feed mills handling a lot of these drugs and have to require um, uh, purchasing to go uh, to go acquire the drug and get it to the feed mill, or there are not enough uh, uh, veterinary public health professionals, veterinarians, to fill the VFDs. Some of the other concerns we've got is it looks like this is going to be a paperwork nightmare because there is a provision under um, federal regulations called Part 11 that requires if if a if a drug if a VFD is is uh, transmitted electronically a feed mill that doesn't have a confirmed electronic system, which is a complicated um, endeavor, must print that and file it. And so there'll be hundreds and thousands of these filed. We're, we're in the process of preparing a, a citizen petition to FDA to ask them to remove the Part 11 requirement because we don't think it's necessary. So also a new thing that came out is veterinarians must complete a veterinarian's intention statement that I'll go over in a moment. And that's principally because uh, in a combination, a drug that's, that's approved in combination, uh, the veterinarian needs to authorize that combination. So the, the, the good thing about the new rule is it allows faxes and PDFs, um, so a scanned VFD going to, uh, from a veterinarian to a producer, that, to a um, producer and feed mill, that's okay. It's just those cannot be... Uh, stored electronically. They have to be printed and filed, and that's going to be a lot of paperwork nightmare, both for FDA that wants to inspect them and for the feed mills. So the veterinarian's affirmation statement is one of three things. Either the vet authorizes the use, um, only, only authorizes the use of the VFD drug on the VFD form and no combination. It allows only uh, a use of the VFD drug and a particular combination that's, that's already approved by FDA, or 
Thirdly, it allows use of the VFD drug with any combination uh, that's currently approved. And um, we've asked veterinarians to mark that third box so that feed mills can actually make a decision of whether customer may ask for a, a drug with an, with an antibiotic and a dewormer in it, which is a, maybe a legal combination that the veterinarian may not be aware of. And we're, we're expecting that Global VetLink will build that into their system. Uh, generic use um, may be allowed under the new VFD if, if, if the um, veterinarian doesn't object. So if, if a company puts the trade name, or the veterinarian puts the trade name on the VFD form and the producer actually doesn't want to pay for the, the, the Pioneer drug, if the veterinarian didn't object on the form, then a generic may be used. So what, what's going to happen? Um, all of these are going to phase in overnight on a couple of days in December, which is a nightmare for our industry. Um, will, the, will the drug sponsors save these and issue of the new drugs all at once? We're told there's a cycle and that FDA is going to save them and issue all the changes at once. So will FDA require training for veterinarians? We're told they don't have that authority. Will there be a list of trained vets? Um, where will the additional vets come from? And will there be a, uh, enforcement against veterinarians that don't really know what they're doing in this? I know that AVMA is working on training vets. This is a rocket science. Um, feed mills have had some problems in the past, but we get those corrected, and so you don't see any problems. No warning letters in 15 years have ever been issued against feed mills for illegal VFDs, which is a good thing. So we're addressing all these issues. We also hope FDA is, is amenable to an orderly phase-in because there's going to be hundreds of thousands of dollars of old premix in the marketplace with one or two, three-year expiration dates. FDA has already issued a notice to the drug sponsors to say you really do need to sticker the old premix bags uh, saying only can be used with a VFD, only can be used for therapeutic uses and not growth promotion. So we're, we're hoping FDA will allow those to be exhausted and um, we're doing a survey, um, and I'll get to in a second. So the new, new VFD rule became effective on October 1. The new form was implemented on October 31. That's basically similar to the other, uh, the old form. The new form does not require veterinarians to estimate tonnage of product to be manufactured. That falls back onto the feed company, which does that on a regular basis. We know that in the summer and fall of this year, the drug sponsors will be contacting feed companies about the label changes. And on January 1, FDA says um, everyone must cease using all growth promotion claim products, and hopefully we'll be able to use the old um, premixes, but it has to have a valid VFT. So we'll likely um, allow some time to exhaust supplies. FDA typically did that, and we're in the process of going out contacting all the feed manufacturers to find out how much of this product they have, what's the dollar volume, and how long it will take to supply it. So um, the drug sponsors are removing all the production claims, leaving the therapeutic claims. They'll contact the feed companies. If they are going to submit new data for, for review, that will take longer. and It will set back the generics that are in the market as well. Um, We've been urging the, the CVM, the Center for Veterinary Medicine, to put out a notice to the industry about the premixes need to be, uh, uh, therapeutic claims need to be in place on January 1 and VFDs. As I said, we're collecting data and hopefully we'll, we'll supply this information to FDA to get an extension of six months or beyond. And that will be the basis of our extension request is this survey of um, feed manufacturers and how many premixes they have in the marketplace. Excellent, Richard. Richard Sellers, Senior Vice President, Public Policy and Education with the American Feed Industry Association. Obviously, a lot of questions, not very much time. That's similar to our situation today at the end of the webinar. Next up today, Dr. Christine Huang, Assistant Director, Division of Animal and Public Health with the American Veterinary Medical Association. Christine, can you hear us? I sure can. Excellent. We are ready to see what you've got for us. Please go ahead. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us. I think um, a couple of things that I have to present might be a little bit duplicative from what um, Richard has said, but um, hopefully it'll reemphasize the, the need for the veterinary feed directive and how it's come about. So um, AVMA has been involved in the VFD for quite some time. 
uh, because of the fact that it is, you know, the veterinary feed directive and, and veterinarians are are responsible for the use and the oversight of these drugs. And so um, we do believe that veterinarians are uniquely qualified to be in this position to oversee the use of these drugs. Um, and so going back just a little bit, I think Richard touched on it, that the, um, the VFD was really established by the Animal Drug Availability Act in 1996. And um, since then, AVMA has had a number of efforts related to antibiotic use and, and the issues around um, antibiotic use in animal agriculture and the potential relationship to resistance. And like Richard, probably I'm not going to debate that or get into that here, but just so that you have an idea of AVMA's longstanding involvement in this, and we were certainly supportive of the um, original um, Animal Drug Availability Act to establish the, the category of drugs for the VSD and to put those drugs under veterinary oversight. And since then, um, more recently, AVMA did have a task force, um, I believe it was in 2010, for um, addressing the use of antimicrobials and the role of the veterinarian in that. And from that, um, AVMA's task force decided that veterinarians should be involved in the decision-making process for the use of antimicrobials in animals. And uh, shortly thereafter, FDA came up with their guidance 209, and in that draft document, they did reference AVMA's um, decision at that time that veterinarians should be involved in that decision-making process. So it really kind of went on from there, where um, AVMA then had a steering committee to determine how best to have veterinary oversight of these drugs, and um, we learned that the regulatory mechanism would really be to um, have these drugs under VFD as a VFD order. And, and I wasn't around in, in 1996 um, in this realm when, when the agreement was made not to retroactively put any drugs in the VFD category, as, as Richard has indicated. But um, we, we all know that now there are a number of drugs that will be um, under the new VFD rule and under veterinary oversight. And so AVMA has a number of um, outreach and education efforts related to the VFD. Most of our member veterinarians do not have a lot of experience with the VFD, even though there have been some products available for many years now. Um, and, and so we've developed some materials to help educate our membership and also to help our veterinarians educate their producers and other people who are involved in, in the VFD process. And so. Um, <clears throat> As you can see here, we have a number of resources, and the, the first is um, actually what we refer to as the steps. It's sort of the one, two, threes of VSDs, and there's a web link there. It is a member-only um, resource, and so uh, you do need to be an AVMA member to access this resource. But essentially, it outlines the details of the steps required for a VSD. Um, the first being, do you really need a VFD and how to determine whether or not that drug is a VFD drug. Um, second is to um, ensure what requirements or terms are required of you as a veterinarian. Third, to um, appropriately enter the information on the VFD order. So we do have a, a sample form that uh, PDF, it's a fillable PDF wherein somebody can just download it and, and fill in the blanks according to the instructions. Or you can use an EVFD service, which would, um, I think, make the process somewhat easier than going through the instruction process. But if you are forced to go pen and paper route, we do have these resources available for our member veterinarians. And <clears throat> providing copies and relaying the information that is the responsibility of the veterinarian to ensure that the client as well as the distributor receive copies of the VFD and record keeping for saving the original copy. And all of those steps are outlined in further detail on our VFD123 website. Um, we also developed instructions that are very specific to how to fill out the VFD form if you don't um, have the luxury of using the electronic VFD. There's instructions that um, clearly indicate what needs to be put in, in in each box on that form. And um, and that does follow the FDA's recommended common format for the form. Um, certainly other forms can be used, but we do recommend that you use AVMA's form if you're going the pen and paper route because it does meet FDA's requirements for what needs to be on the form. 
I did want to just sort of briefly show what that looks like for those of you who can't access um, the number only area. But all of these areas correspond to specific instructions. So, um, for example, M here addresses the affirmation of intent statement that Richard had referred to earlier. And if you scroll down to M, you can see the descriptions behind the affirmation of intent statement and which one you should choose or what might help you choose the particular statement that you want. On to the other VFD requirements. For the veterinarian, um, there are two essential requirements for issuing a VFD, one being that you have to be licensed to practice. And that does <coughs> mean in the state where the animals reside. And then two, be operating in compliance with all applicable licenses licensure and practice requirements, including the VCPR as it's defined by the state. And so this VCPR stuff does get a little bit complicated, and um, I was going to delve into it a little bit deeper here. Um, <clears throat> the VCPR that is defined in federal statute is the one that is in 21 CFR 530.3, and it has those three elements that you see there. I did want to call attention to um, <clears throat> The, the last statement where it says um, the veterinarian has to have recently seen and is personally acquainted with keeping in care of the animals by examination and or by medically appropriate and timely visits to the premises inferring a geographic location. Uh, state VCPRs can vary and there is this chart that is linked to um, from AVMA's instructions site as well as um, linked from the FDA site where you can look through and determine based on the state in which the animals reside and where you are practicing which VCPR you have to go by. And so if it says federal, then you have to go by that VCPR that's in um, 530.3. If it says state, it tells you where you can find your state's VCPR. So that's a very helpful chart for, for anyone who's trying to determine which VCPR you have to follow. And then we also have AVMA's VCPR, which we have been encouraging the states to adopt. And the reason for that is because if you look at AVMA's VCPR, it says timely visits by the veterinarian to the operation and not necessarily um, the premises. And we believe that provides a little bit more latitude for the veterinarian in being able to establish a VCPR without having to go to each and every single premise. Um, <clears throat> this is also compliant with the FDA's guidelines on what constitutes a valid VCPR. So if the state adopt this particular VCPR, you would still be in compliance and not have to adhere to the federal VCPR. Um, I did want to address some of the concerns that have been brought up um, by the previous speaker and also things that we've heard. And, and the affirmation of intent statements does tend to be something that's pretty confusing for a lot of people. Um, AVMA has been <coughs> emphasizing that this last statement, the third statement, is likely to be the one that most would choose, especially if you aren't terribly familiar with um, <clears throat> writing VFDs. It's also the one that provides the most flexibility and latitude for the combination of drugs. The first statement would be what we would consider to be the most restrictive option because you really are only authorizing that specific drug and no other drug in combination. So this is listed essentially in priority order of um, most restrictive to least restrictive options. Um, <clears throat> so the, these questions actually I, I pulled from um, Richard Seller's slides to answer a couple of questions about training for for veterinarians, certainly AVMA is doing the best that we can to um, provide as much training as we can on VFDs and, and the transition from over-the-counter to be at VFDs or, or, or prescription-only status. Um, and FDA does not require that training, but there is a, a VFD training module that is in development through the National Veterinary Accreditation Program. And so um, through that, in essence, there is sort of a, a list of trained vets because veterinarians who are accredited and have completed that training module, there is a, a list of accredited veterinarians by the state so that um, there is some information related to who's been trained and, and how. Um, in terms of having more 
veterinarians. Well, we, we hope that the veterinary medicine loan repayment program will help have more veterinarians, but it also um, emphasizes the need for adherence to AVMA's VCPR, wherein there's that latitude to visit the operation as opposed to a single geographic premise. Um, so we think that that might be helpful as well to provide more veterinary access. And then in terms of enforcement, um, it is true that uh, there isn't a whole lot of enforcement authority and that's partially why the FDA had determined that um, the state VCPRs should be adhered to if they um, meet certain requirements, essentially because the state licensing board is responsible for enforcing any violation of the State Practice Act. So um, the ramifications could be uh, fines or so much as even uh, withdrawal of a veterinary license if you are violating the State Practice Acts, which govern uh, the, the VCPR and the practice of veterinary medicine. Um, <clears throat> so AVMA has been very focused on antibiotic stewardship, and I think that this is sort of um, the VFD process is really a big piece of that. How can we be better stewards of antibiotics and, and how can we um, ensure that the drugs are used as, as responsibly as possible? And so AVMA's efforts on stewardship overall in, in both the food animal and companion animal arena is listed here at our um, avma.org forward slash antibiotic use page. Um, there's definitely a lot of regulatory support that we're seeing for stewardship in terms of increasing veterinary oversight, um, the transition to VFDs and the transition to uh, prescription status for the antimicrobials in water that are me medically important, and of course the phasing out of um, production uses of antimicrobials all tie into the, the thought process behind antibiotic stewardship. And so um, just in closing, a lot of times we get asked, well, you know, what is the point of this and, and why, are, why are we trying to do all of this? And it's really about that, um, that one health picture where if we all participate in, in having greater veterinary oversight, it will have better stewardship of the antimicrobial drugs and, and we'll have healthy animals, safe food, and a healthy world. Excellent, Christine. Dr. Christine Hong, the Assistant Director, Division of Animal and Public Health with the American Veterinary Medical Association. Really good information. We appreciate you bringing that to us today. Next up, Kaylin Henry's Product Manager with Global Vet Link. Hopefully, Kaylin, you've got some answers for all these questions. Are you with us? I am. Can you hear me all right, Ned? We hear you fine. Please go ahead. Great, thank you for the introduction and also the opportunity to share with the group how electronic systems can help prepare for this VFD transition. Um, so what I'm going to do is do a brief demo this morning of our electronic system. Um, just go over a few of the highlights and, and some how they relate back to some of the points that the previous speakers have brought up. Um, obviously there's a few main concerns and one of those is uh, just the sheer volume of paperwork, the increase in paperwork that's going to happen January 1, 2017. So we want to help you out with that. So in our system, um, what we can do is we can store contacts. Uh, this is logged in as a veterinarian. Um, the veterinarian can store contacts and reuse those contacts over and over again. Um, so it's not like writing on a piece of paper every time you have to write a VFD. We can pull that contact in here. We have an email address field so we can deliver the VFD via email. We can also give owners or clients access to myvetlink.com, which allows them to log in and retrieve the VFDs, along with other health documents their veterinarian creates online. So um, really great storage of that client information in here and the ability to pass those documents on to that client. Same thing is true for the feed mills. We have uh, the list of feed distributors populated here. Um, also, their email address on file. If we have that email address on file, we're going to email that VFD to the feed mill. Um, so once again, helping the vet take care of those responsibilities that they have that include getting a copy to both the owner and that mill. 
The Feed Mill also has the opportunity to set up an account with us so that they can just retrieve those online, use that account for that two-year record storage, and be able to easily retrieve those documents if they need to in the case of an inspection. As we scroll down the screen, we can put in uh, multiple locations where those animals are going to be fed. As long as those animals are owned by the same owner, we can put an unlimited number of locations on this VFD. When we continue down the form, um, we're going to get into the uh, kind of the heart of the VFD itself where we start specifying what species we're writing this VFD for, the number of head to be fed. This is one of those big changes that came about with the rule when it was implemented October 1st. In the old VFD world, we had to specify, or the veterinarian had to specify pounds or tons of feed. Um, that's no longer the case. That's not the vet's job to have to worry about uh, how much those animals are eating, what their daily feed in intake is in at the time. They just have to say the approximate number of head to be fed over the time span of this VFD. Then we get into the drug selection section. Here we can search by active ingredient, brand name, indication, or sponsor. Um, I'm going to pull up Pulmatil here for cattle. Um, once I do that, what you'll notice is uh, some of these, these boxes are pre-populated. These are pre-populated according to that label. So we're working with the drug sponsor to get all of that label information in here and get it accurate. So in this, in this example, there is only one approved production class, and that's for cattle in confinement for slaughter only one approved indication for bovine respiratory disease. So we don't allow the vet to go in and, and edit this or type over it. Um, we're really trying to help make sure they write these VFDs according to label um, because that's another point that I think everyone probably already knows on the call, but any of these drugs going into the feed cannot be used extra label. Um, that's not new. That's always been the case. It's just now you're having to put that down on paper so we really want to help you out with that uh, to make sure you know what those approved indications and production classes are. So the effective date and expiration dates are here. The expiration date uh, will be set according to this drug's label as well. There was a little bit of confusion early on when the rule came out, when the rule stated that the expiration would be no more than six months in the future. Some folks assumed then that meant that every VFD would have a six-month expiration. That is not the case. Some of these drugs have a shorter expiration. So uh, Pulmatil for cattle, example, for example, has a 45-day expiration. Um, and uh, on the swine side, they're on 90-day. So that is all set dependent on that label. So I pulled Pulmatil for cattle up for a reason here because it is a drug that has an approved combination. And uh, both Christine and Richard mentioned those intention statements. And here we have them, the three radio buttons you can choose which one of those intent statements you want as a veterinarian to specify on that form. Um, what we do here on the electronic form is give you the list of approved combinations for this specific drug. Um, in this case, there is only the one, um, but if there were multiple, you could specify which one if for some reason you didn't want to approve all of those combinations. Um, in the case where there are no approved combinations, the user only gets this first option that says it is not intended to authorize the use of such drugs in combination with any other animal drugs. So we really try to guide you through, and as I say, that's based on working with those drug sponsors to get all of the um, appropriate and accurate information. Same thing over here on our dosage and our duration side of things. Uh, this is all set up per label as well. It's not going to let me put in um, 
a concentration that is not within the acceptable range, and same thing on the duration of, of feeding for this drug as well. So um, again, those are pulled off of that label. So the great thing at any time, you can go ahead and save this. Um, if you have a vet assistant that you want to set up an account uh, to help set these up, we have a non-signing rule where that vet assistant can help the veterinarian. They can save them. The vet can come in later, preview all of that information, and then sign them. Signing is a really important part of this process. These are our electronic signatures. I call this our signing ceremony. It's a signing ceremony because we want you to be making that conscious effort to sign this document. Just like when you take a pen to paper, um, we have you enter your username and password in here, and that allows uh, that document to be locked and signed. And that's all part of that 21 CFR Part 11 compliance um, in an electronic solution. So we have the security on those documents to, to, help, um, to help with that compliance. So we can sign those documents. And um, then they will be made available electronically to the feed mill and to the animal owner or client. So that takes care of that piece for the veterinarian. Um, the other thing that it makes it really easy for the veterinarian to do is come in and find those VFDs again if they need to. So for some reason, uh, there's an inspection they can come in here, run a certificate search. Um, they can add additional information if it's maybe one specific drug, feed distributor, et cetera. Um, and then they can batch these and uh, email or print them for that inspector so they can make them really easily available. Uh, they're not plowing through filing cabinets filled with these VFDs to find the information that, that the inspector is looking for. A couple of other points on, on ways the electronic process can help the parties involved. Uh, expiration reminders are sent out to the uh, veterinarian, the producer, and the feed mill, as long as we have email addresses on file. So we know that um, you've got to have that VFD in order to feed that feed. So if that VFD is about to expire and you've still got feed, um, you want to make sure that you've got a new VFD written. So those expiration reminders will help ensure that everyone uh, has the documentation they need when they need it. In addition to the veterinarian's login, we also implemented a feed mill or feed distributor login in December. Prior to the rule, there hadn't been a lot of interest in for the feed mills. Um, we've been doing this for, for 10 years for, uh, for Pulmatil. Um, and you know, just the sheer volume of VFDs that are going to go through in the next year um, made the mills and distributors a lot more interested in having a login as well so that they could have these saved in a database, easy retrieval, and so forth. So those feed mills can come in, see uh, the current VFDs they have here. They can search by effective, or sorry, sort by effective and expiration dates use a filter to quickly and easily find a VFD. Um, and they can also, from this screen, log shipment information. So if they want to log a shipment date, you know, note how many tons they, they sent out on this date, um, so forth, they can do that right here for their own record keeping purposes. More importantly, again, they have that easy ability to store these records for two years um, and also retrieve them if they need to. So just like the vets, they can do a certificate search. Uh, they can narrow that search criteria down um, and quickly and easily make those documents available um, if they end up in an inspection situation. 
So those are the basics of the veterinarian login and the feed mill login. Um, we encourage folks uh, now to start looking at options like this to be prepared for that January 1, 2017 date. Um, you can start loading customer information right now. I have had several veterinary customers express that they're going to start having producer meetings where they're gathering information like um, you know the the drugs that they're using the time of year the feed mills that they're using um, the whole thing is really about increasing that communication between the veterinarian the producer and the feed mill so uh, we really encourage you to start now uh, the sooner the better and uh, hopefully uh, solutions like this can really help ease that transition. Thank you. Kaylin Henry. Excellent, excellent information, Kaylin, at Global Vet Link here in Ames, Iowa. Thank you for sharing that today. So, Richard Sellers, over to you. This is from Mark. If a producer grinds his own feed on his farm, then does he also need to have his farm registered to distribute? How? I've heard this question a lot. How does an individual grinder, how does that fit into the VFD program? Um, it, it's fairly simple. Unless they're a feed distributor, they don't have to notify FDA that they are intending to distribute a VFD feed. Uh, it's not really a registration. It's a one-time notification to the agency that you, in, you have a VFD uh, drug and you intend to make medicated feed. So if the producer were to provide feed to other locations um, that contains a VFD, then the producer could be a feed distributor and notify FDA, but, but in that case they also have to notify the supplier of the VFD drug uh, that they will not distribute that VFD product without um, getting a similar acknowledgement letter or having a valid VFD. Consider the producers the won't be feed distributors. Okay, very good. That's the, that's the question. Most producers distribute will not be distributors, and then if the title of the animals changes as they take it to a different location, then that's a question they really need to find out more about. So if they, if they take in a VFD medicated feed, uh, they don't have to register because that's under the control of a VFD. But if they take that VFD feed and supply it to another producer, another location, then they can be a feed distributor. Otherwise, no. The VFD itself so, uh, the, the, the rules say the VFD receiving, getting a VFD and getting a VFD feed means you don't have to register or you don't have to send that letter of um, we got the feed or we got the Good VFD. All right, super. Thank you very much. Going over to Christine. Christine Douglas asked that you would clarify the use of the acknowledgement letter and intent to distribute letter. Much confusion exists, and this kind of falls under the same category that Richard was talking about, but I'm wondering about it from your perspective. Yeah, I think um, Richard probably answered that question really well about um, the the letter to where you're intending to distribute. So if you're grinding your own feed on farm, you obviously don't need to submit that letter because you're not serving as a distributor and further distributing that, um, that medication. So, um, but I did want to add to what Richard was saying and specify that in order to feed that drug, you would have to have a VFD order from a veterinarian. So to legally use and feed that drug, um, you still have to have that VFD order. Excellent. Thanks for the clarification. Going back to Richard on this, this is from Mike. As a distributor and feed manufacturing company, if we receive a VFD that will be going out in multiple shipments, are we, the distributor and feed manufacturing company, are we responsible to keep track of the amount sent on each load so as not to go over the amount of medication listed on the original VFD, where does that responsibility rest, Richard? The responsibility rests with the medicated feed manufacturer or feed distributor. Um, the VFD no longer contains an amount to be manufactured. That's to be determined solely by the feed manufacturer based on the number of animals the veterinarian has said there and the knowledge that the feed company and the veterinarian have about the age of the animals and the expected consumption. When the veterinarian 
and the, in the old form had to guess or had to calculate uh, the amount of feed to be manufactured. Frequently the feed company came up short and they had to go back because maybe the weather changed and they ate more feed. Go back to the veterinarian and get another VFD, but right now the feed company determines that solely. So if if they make a calculation uh, based on that VFD and they ship out uh, half of it or there's, there's more left or whatever, then they just keep a record notation in their GMP records that we shipped out uh, three tons and there's seven tons remaining on what we calculate this order needs. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. Uh, Kaylin, this kind of falls in your area, in your basket. Electronic VFDs, this come fr comes from Lily. Are electronic VFDs compliant as the original VFD format? And, and how do you determine between those? How, how will I know, okay, this is acceptable, this is not? Sure. An electronic VFD that is, um, that is initiated in a system that is 21 CFR Part 11 compliant um, is, is acceptable. So uh, a system like ours, we generate that, we have those electronic signatures, we have specific security around our, our system and the way we do things. Um, that is an official document in electronic format. Um, if you have a paper copy uh, that's just scanned, you know, that is not the same as, you know, a paper copy that was handwritten um, that's sc a scanned document, that is not considered an electronic VFD. Okay, good. Uh, Dr. Huang will ask you this question. Uh, it's coming in several different forms, but speak for just a moment to lesser species. Of course, we know where we are on beef, swine, possibly lambs. I'm getting questions on fish, camelids. What is, what is the determinant on the need of BFD, and is it something as simple as, is it a food animal? Um, I think that um, to, to start, the best way of explaining it is that there is no extra label use of VFD drugs. So if the species is not indicated on the label, be it, uh, you know, a camelid, a, a fish, or what have you, then it is not allowed to be used in that species. There is currently no accommodation under um, minor use, minor species for extra label use of the VFD drugs. Um, that's something that the FDA is aware um, is a concern and they're working on some solutions to the problem. My understanding is that um, they intend to amend um, a compliance guide, it's CPG 615.115, I believe, um, that addresses extra label use of medicated feeds to hopefully include the VFD drugs. But at this time, any extra label use of feeds is strictly prohibited. Good, good. Thanks for clarifying that for us. Kaylin Reed asks, will Global VetLink offer prescriptions for water medications in addition to VFDs? Kaylin? Great question. Yes, we are right in the midst of getting a product called ScriptLink ready. Um, and so, yeah, our first, uh, first goal with that is to have those water solubles that are also affected by this rule um, ready for January 1, 2017 as well. Very good. I appreciate that, Kaylin. Good information. So as I look down through the questions, and, and they're still coming in, I have a question from Diana just to clarify. I think this goes back to Christine. Can only vets fill out VFDs? I work at a feed order desk for a company, and the vet just signs VFDs now. So the question is, who actually implements the information and then authorizes that? Christine? Well, the veterinarian certainly is responsible for any of the information that is on the VFD by placing their signature on there. So um, certainly it's, it's not an issue if someone else is, is filling out the preliminary information, but the, by signing the veterinarian is responsible for all of that information on the VFD and ensuring that it is accurate. Good, appreciate that update. By the way, we are coming up on uh, 1257 here Central Time. We're scheduled to go until 1 o'clock. We may go a few minutes past that. Uh, certainly feel free to continue to send questions and we'll try to get information back to you after the seminar if we don't have a chance to do that. Um, 
one of the questions that's up is from Megan. She wants to know what happens if I want to retract or cancel a VFD. And Kaylin, I'm going to ask you about that. How do you retract or cancel a VFD that's been written? Sure. So we have a void option available. Um, so that would allow you to uh, to cancel a VFD. Very good. So it's easy as a button to push. Richard, um, <laughs> again, a question that I've heard many times as I've traveled across the country. Medicated feed in the bin midnight January 1st. What, what would you suggest that we do at this point, or are we better off just waiting until we know more? Yeah, that's probably a good question. Currently, um, we, we expect an FDA, and we're working on premixes and feed mills, um, Typically, when FDA does a drug change of something that's been a long-standing drug, they allow the premix to be used over a six-month period and the, and the drug to be used over a, I mean, the finished feed to be used over a year that allows the product and, say, retail establishments and dealers to be used up. We, we fully expect that we'll be asking the agency for that kind of timeline. As for something that happens after midnight that's in the, in the bin, I think, the agency will include that in our request. We'll allow that to be used up because the order was actually placed beforehand and it would be a bit problematic to go back and get that uh, product, a new uh, or a VFD issued for that product that's already in the bin and there would be a massive amount of work to do that. And I would suspect that FDA might allow, since the product was already made under a relationship that was prior to January 1 that they'll continue to allow it to be used up. But we'll put that in our letter to them. Good. Good information. Thank you. Um, from Brett, Christine, I'm, I'm going to put this to you. Uh, it's a really good question and it has to do with educational resources. Brett asks, will there be educational resources for owner producers about VFDs to help ease the transition without the veterinarian being seen as the opposition? And again, questions especially from the veterinarians. Well, my clients aren't going to be very happy with this. How do I ease that? I know that you've got a lot of educational tools out there, but are, are you looking at ways to help us explain to the end user what this is about and why it's important to implement? Christine? Yes, definitely. That's that's a piece that we're we're looking into. Um, we thought first and for, foremost we need to educate our member veterinarians on on how to use the VFD and how to do it appropriately. But then next on that list is definitely how can we help our members answer the questions that are coming from the producers and help ease that transition. And um, the thought of you know providing some historical information and, and background information to help the producers understand the the why of it all is um, is a very good point. Very good information. Thank you. Uh, Richard, finally, uh, last question for you, and it's one again because you have a hand on what's happening out in, in the field through your organization, the American Feed Industry Association. Uh, Lori says they're hearing from the field there's a disconnect for some cow-calf veterinarians to even understand the VFD since they don't work with medicated additives as frequently. And, and so I'm going to expand that and say those groups that do not have a veterinary client relationship uh, with a veterinary currently, how, how anxious are you about reaching them and are, what, what is your organization doing to help get that knowledge out in the field to those smaller vets or those smaller producers? Yeah, that's, a, that's a very good question and a point. We've, we've um, committed to paying our own expense to travel to any meeting to talk about VFD. I've spoken with the Academy of Veterinary Consultants. I talk regularly to, to um, the bovine practitioners, swine veterinarian group, and the avian pathologist. And we've, we have a standing offer to any of those groups to come and talk to them. Um, if, a, if a veterinarian is not a member of one of those groups um, through their state organization, we can meet or hold a webinar with the state organizations as well at their annual meetings or uh, talk with um, the, the state veterinarian who may hold a meeting. We know a number of states, Oregon and Washington held a state, a public meeting and invited groups. Um, so the feed administrator in each state can hold a meeting along with the state veterinarian to um, discuss how this will proceed in their state. 
Thank and we're you. open to that. Thank you. Appreciate that update. Kalen, uh, Richard asked, actually he, he'd asked Christine, but you may be able to have a better answer on it. Will I be able to fill out the VFD form using a text editor like Adobe? So I'm throwing this to you because I assume that you know more about the alternatives out there than most of us. So certainly within the VFD system, uh, within the Global VetLink system, there are ways to do that easily. Of those other options out there, have you worked with them, and is it something as simple as an Adobe type product that we can fill those out one at a time? Sure. So obviously, with our system, it's all database uh, generated, so there isn't just a form to fill out. We auto generate that form for you. Um, but you know, uh, like Christine showed, there is there's the AVMA uh, standard form. There will be other forms out there. Um, technically, you you know you can write a VFD on anything as long as it has all of the required information. Um, so I would expect there will be. Um, PDF, fillable PDF versions potentially. Um, I am not currently aware of, of those, um, but uh, you know, definitely um, I would expect that there would be some out there. And the AVMA, form, the AVMA form is a fillable PDF. I just wanted to let you know that. Very good. Good. That, that will answer Richard's question. And while we've got you, a uh, final question for you, Dr. Huang. Um, the timing. Obviously, today we're anxious. We will continue to get to be more so as January 1st nears, but what should organizations, producers, where should the focus be? What are the steps that we can be taking now in order to perhaps have a little less of a boondoggle on December 31st at midnight? I think the, the most important step is um, you know, information and, and learning, really, to learn as much about the process as, as we all can and, and to make sure that we share that information with each other. And I think also a huge part of that learning process is identifying what it is that we don't know. And that's something certainly here at um, AVMA we could use some assistance with in, in learning what, um, what it is that folks want to know more about. And, um, and we can help try to find that information and get it out to our, to our membership and share that amongst the other VSD stakeholders as well. So I think it's really um, about the learning process, getting information and learning what we know as well as what we don't know. Very good. Dr. Christine Huang, Richard Sellers of the American Feed Industry Association, and Kaylin Henry here at Global Vet Link. Thank you for joining us today on the Global Vet Link Veterinary Feed Directives Taking Action webinar. Just this quick reminder that the webinar is accredited for one hour of race certified continuing education. This credit will be awarded to registered attendees that attend no less than 45 minutes of the 60 minute session. And a recorded version of the webinar will be available for CE credit. Each individual that wants to obtain CE credit must submit a passing post test, which will be available at Global Link globalvetlink.com slash VFDs taking action. It's been a good program today. We look forward to talking with you again as information continues to come down the pike as we get more of these questions answered. Certainly Global Vet Link, a go-to spot to find out what the current status is on these regulations and how to best deal with them. I'm Ned Arthur from Truffle Media Networks. Thank you for joining us.